You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael, on a Monday afternoon, joined by Pedro Gabriel. Pedro, welcome to the show. I know you're a Catholic. You have a book that you have written on Amor Satizia, and we're going to talk about its orthodoxy. But have, how have you been? It's been a little while since I've had you on. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, and yes, uh, I have written a book. Uh, it's called The Orthodoxy of Amor's Letizia, published by Whip and Stock. And uh, in this book, what I tried to do was to uh, first try to ascertain what the most uh, plausible, most cogent interpretation for Amor's Letizia is, and then try to reconcile it with uh, a hermeneutic of continuity with previous magisterial documents and pronouncements, namely also uh, giving an answer to uh, most of the criticisms that I that are uh, usual uh, that are usually mm -hmm. leveled against this document. So before we talk about the orthodoxy of it itself, let's maybe just start out. What is the teaching of the church on divorce and remarriage? Well, obviously, the teaching is that divorce and remarriage is uh, not possible, at least obviously while the other spouse is alive, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the church might admit in certain extreme cases tolerate divorce, mm -hmm. but not remarriage. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the teaching of the church, and it's based on the indissolubility of the sacrament of matrimony, and this mm -hmm. is infallible, it's unchangeable, and it has to be, uh, the church has to teach this and for until the end of times. Now, uh, yeah. Well, you made a distinction there between divorce and divorce and remarriage. Could you flesh that yes. out for us a little bit? Well, the Catechism states that divorce can be tolerated in certain extreme cases, uh, and that's mainly the, the, the distinction that I have made. But the problem is, uh, whereas just separating uh, in, in itself does not, uh, as St. John Paul II, it does not contradict the, the, the bond between uh, Christ in the church because the bond is still there okay mm -hmm. um, this is just something that is tolerated uh, mm -hmm. by uh, uh, since they, these are extreme cases and mm -hmm. the obviously the human elements that are involved in these scenarios are imperfect and they are not mirroring the bond between Jesus and the church but the bond is still there now, when we have a remarriage, then there is an objective contra contradiction with that bond. It's like the church decides to go with another Jesus, or it, Jesus would would not be faithful to us. This is obviously not something that can exist, not something that, or rather it can exist, but it's something that is sinful, something that is objectively, intrinsically wrong. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is Amor Satizia as far as a document? Let's maybe also address that before we dive into the content of the document itself. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a debate that has been going on for a lot of time, at least since the 1980s. Uh, which is, since uh, since divorce has become so prevalent in our society, how mm -hmm. do we integrate those who have divorced and remarry? Mm -hmm. uh, in the time of uh, St. John Paul II, we have a uh, synod on the family, and this was already discussed. And what J John Paul II uh, decided on those synods was that these couples should not receive communion unless they were willing to live as brother and sister mm -hmm. okay so uh, because if they did not then 
the 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 bond what is signified by the bond relatively to the relation between Jesus and the church that would be a contradiction so even here we see it's not just all it's not just the remarriage they could be divorced they could be remarried but they could not live a married life they could not live uh, not have intercourse they had to live as brothers and sisters now um of course this controversy never completely went away and uh, the the first synods that pope francis held were on the family in 2014 and 2015 and pope francis attempted a, a middle ground which is to try to uh, take recourse to uh, a, a teaching of the that of the church that was already implemented at the time which is the doctrine of mitigating circumstances which is no one disputes that these situations are, these situations are objectively wrong but not all people are equally culpable and since they are not equally culpable they might not be in mortal sin since mortal sin involves three components the grave grave matter it's present period and full knowledge and full consent so what pope francis decided to do was uh, as a, a compromise situation between the liberal and conservative factions was to go to this traditional teaching of the church and say well if they are not immortal sin they can receive communion so we have to discern on a case-by-case -case basis whether these people have subjective culpability or not um and of course this uh, of course no it, this was not necessary but the the document was very badly received uh, especially from people who uh, on previous pontificates uh, had gained some um, notoriety as commentators catholic commentators catholic theologians uh, and they have been casting shadow uh, shadow of doubt over this document ever since where while pope francis clearly tried to delineate a continuity with previous teachings that were already in place before you mentioned their mitigating circumstances and you spoke about one of them being a lack of knowledge but some might ask well how long does it take to have that dispelled to be aware of what the church teaches and no longer say that they have a lack of knowledge it seems like a priest could have a conversation with one of these people very quickly and then they would no longer be in a position seemingly that they don't have a lack of knowledge what would you say in response to that well that's actually something that is very interesting uh, i note that on my book that when we talk about mitigating circumstances that uh usually the response is well full knowledge can easily be um taught and be uh, discussed with a person and this person would not be in, uh, in ignorance in invincible ignorance well and in my book i make a distinction uh, there is a, a pastoral principle that is a principle of good faith which is that sometimes uh, you have to see if you believe that just giving this information to the person um, and this person is not ready to receive it, then this person will uh, go from being just a, a formal, um, a formal um, a material um, a, a sinner to formal sinner, which is worse. But the situation is actually goes even beyond this, which is the people usually focus on the full knowledge part of the equation but i think that pope francis actually does not dwell too much on the full knowledge he dwells more on the full consent yeah and it, whereas full knowledge he dedicates like two lines of the amoris letitia to that full consent is like two paragraphs and mm -hmm. full consent it's not just whether you to be freely consenting to an act it's not just saying oh yes i do or no i don't no there are 
and the catechism delineates these factors, there are many factors that may diminish culpability because they diminish the freedom of the consent from fear, from addiction, from so social factors, psychological factors. For, I think that one of the things that Pope Francis says, and I also mentioned this in, this in the book, is whether this person that is in this situation will uh, believe that breaking the bond will endanger the, the well-being of the children that may have resulted from this remarriage. Uh, they might f f may, might be afraid that the other person is going to flee, going away, going to abandon them, and the children will be left without a mother or father figure, on financial uh, financial distress. And I must again say this is not to say that it's justified. Mm -hmm. It's not justified. It's whether this person is as culpable. As someone who just says, well, I don't care about church teaching. I'm just going to do what I want. Okay. Yeah. This person is not equally culpable. This person is probably in a, in a very, uh, in a very, in anguish. Uh, this person wants to follow church teaching, but for, on the other hand, is terrorized, paralyzed by fear. And uh, let's see, maybe this person is not freely consenting. This person just uh, just wants to keep the family together. And when they when this when this person, this situation uh, does it, maybe he or she is not in mortal sin. And maybe if they receive communion, they actually may receive uh, grace that will help them strengthen them to eventually correct their situation. Yeah, I have some of the same observations about full consent that you've mentioned here, but I would also bring it back to full knowledge. I would argue that just because somebody has been told the teaching of the church doesn't mean that they still have full knowledge. Just merely hearing the teaching doesn't mean full knowledge. Full knowledge would actually mean hearing it in a convincing way, not just merely hearing it. So I do think that there is something to be said about that. Now, I mentioned, I mentioned there's a difference between hearing and understanding. And yeah. understanding is sometimes it's not just an intellectual act. Understanding has to come from the heart. And uh, I think that many, many people today may, you know, there's this saying, I think it was from Fulton Sheen or something like that, that many, many people nowadays, they, they don't reject the church, they reject a, a construction that they have of the church, even if they, if it, even if they know what the church teaches, do they really understand what the church teaches? Maybe, maybe there's a distinction here between, between knowing uh, as in having this information and actually understanding knowledge as understanding now in in the document itself and of course in the follow-up uh to it that pope uh, francis issued with the buenos Aires bishops which we'll talk about here in a moment do you ever get the impression that he's saying to these people that they can receive holy communion uh without going to the sacrament of reconciliation first well, I think that's difficult to, it's difficult to argue like that because let's see, the footnote that opens the path to the sacrament of Eucharist doesn't mention just the Eucharist. It mentions Eucharist and reconciliation, the controversial footnote. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, for me, it's, uh, for me, it's uh, obvious that those are are not meant to be uh, not meant to be separated. And mm -hmm. in another part of the of Amor Zotiti, he even says that he doesn't want the sacrament of reconciliation to become a torture chamber. Mm -hmm. So obviously, he wants people to go to the sacrament of reconciliation. He wants um, he wants uh, people to have the grace of the sacraments not just Eucharist. He wants people to have grace to face this challenge. Mm. 
Do you talk about the issue of firm purpose of amendment? Because people are going to say, well, yeah, but confession has always been available to them. However, the problem is some people are going to say, well, if you're still living in this situation, then you don't have a firm purpose of amendment. Therefore, your confession is not valid. And it seems that Pope Francis is saying, no, that is not necessarily the case. A firm purpose of amendment doesn't necessarily mean that you might not be in this John Paul II situation. So, can you maybe talk about that? Well, uh, yes. On my book, I actually tackle that. And I even base myself in something that was uh, explained by Rocco Buttiglione. Who he, wrote, he also wrote a book about Amor's Letizia, though unfortunately it's not in English. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, this, he explains how there this firm purpose of amendment you have to take into consideration also the intent of the person is this person if this person this person wants to amend herself but since the this person is paralyzed by these med- mitigating factors uh, that her culpability is not as great as if this was freely chosen so I, there is a firm, there is a purpose of amendment. The person wants to regularize this situation, her situation. But at that moment, she, uh, he or she might feel like they they don't under don't know how. Okay, and the task of the pastor is to help, is to help them achieve that, achieve what their their uh, purpose of amendment wants them to bring to, but they don't know how to get there. Okay, there is a firm purpose purpose of amendment, but it maybe it's not that it's we should not be as rigid as what John Paul II said. No, it's, it is as John Paul II said. It's just that we should not be as impatient with that. The purpose of amendment is there, but it might take some time to materialize. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So. When it comes to the reaction that was given to the document, there were four cardinals who submitted a questionnaire, the Duvia as it's called, and they were asking for some clarification on, I believe it's five points. And so Pope Francis never directly answered it. Can you maybe comment on that situation and maybe why he didn't do so? Well, I dedicate a whole chapter to the Dubia situation. Uh, uh, basically, I think that the dubia would have been um, a good means of clarification if they had been posed in a different way. Okay, mm-hmm. if you check uh, the dubia, you see that they usually go like this. Uh, you know that dubia must be answered in a yes or no way, or at least as most uh, as closer as possible to a yes or no. And so what the dubia, the dubia are worded in a way that says, uh, if Amoris Letizia, if the teaching of Amoris Letizia is, um, is accurate, do we still hold true to what was uh, said before? And then it tries to pit Amoris Letizia against canon law, against Veritate Splendor, against Familiaris Consortio. So it's like trying to say, either the Pope would say yes, and by saying just yes, oh, there's a contradiction, or he would say no, and then then what he wanted to implement with Amoris Letizia would, wouldn't, uh, it would be denied. Now, um, another thing that was badly done in this situation was that the dubia were sent to the pope and then they just gave him like less than two months to answer whereas i i show in my book there are dubia that are unanswered for years and and when the dubia were not answered in these two months the the cardinals just published them in several catholic media outlets along with a note that would say uh, that said uh, th- an explicatory note it's not like the dubia were meant to gather answers it's like they already have the answers i have a note here ec- uh, explaining how each answer that the pope can give is wrong or right okay and even afterwards 
just one day after publishing the Dubia, Colonel Burke gave an interview to National Catholic Register and said, if I don't get the answer that I look for, I will go forth with a fraternal correction. Okay, so I think that in this situation, how can we, how can the Pope answer the dubia? It's validating uh, a complete irregularity, a complete irregular setting. How can the Pope answer the dubia? It would be saying, oh yes, you can do this. I'm going to answer because uh, I think that the way this was done uh, is nothing special. I, I'll just answer it. No, no. The, 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 this imagine that some liberal bishops would just go ahead and do something like that with Humanae Vitae or, or, some, or, or any other church document. Like, this is not the way, okay? Usually what happens is the dubia are submitted, the CDF or the Pope, but usually the CDF will reply. And the CDF, when they reply in their own timing, they make it public. And then, okay, then the situation is clarified. If the Pope said yes, it's yes. If the Pope said no, it's no. It's not, uh, oh, I agree or disagree. No, you, you ask the Pope what he thought. That you ask the Pope to arbitrate. Okay? So uh, I think that in this situation, Pope Francis decided for an alternative venue. Since people were saying, oh, this is ambiguous, this is confusing. He just published the Buenos Aires guidelines to say, well, this is the correct interpretation. This is my clarification, okay? And this has precedent. Uh, I, as I explained in my book, uh, Monsignor Lefebvre, he sent uh, also 34 uh, dubia about religious freedom and ecumenism, about Vatican II teachings on humanism. And those dubia were never answered, but uh, the CDF sent uh, a reply that was not answering these dubia yes or no, but reiterating what the church teaches. And I, <clears throat> I think that's important because even if there was a response to the dubia, that still doesn't get to the heart of Amor Laetitia. In other words, the dubia could be answered and the question of Amor Laetitia would still remain because they're not actually asking questions that are actually re related and relevant to the document, but are more relevant to perhaps misunderstandings and distortions of the document. And, mm -hmm. and I do think that that's, that's a noteworthy point. What, what do you think about that? Well, yes, obviously. It's one of the things that I really, that I, I wrote a, an article actually recently in Where Peter Is, uh, one of my latest articles that was precisely, uh, I think that conservatives, I, I'm not, I'm not anti-conservative at all, uh, uh, I, but I think that conservatives had a very good position in the beginning of this pontificate. They had lots of Catholic media outlets, lots of, uh, they, their voice was heard because they, in the previous pontificates, they gained notoriety, they gained, um, they gained uh, some, um, credibility because they were defending the church in very hard teachings. Humanae Vitae, um, the sexual anthropology of the church, they were defending it. And, and I think it was such a, such a misstep because they could have done this differently that with Amoris Letizia, they could have tried to dispel the confusion. It's, I don't think that it's so difficult to understand the Mors Letizia, it's based on something that was completely uncontroversial in the previous two pontificates. Of course, it was applied to other sins, but if you just peruse the Catholic forums that deal with other sexual sins, like masturbation, pornography, etc., you will see everyone is saying, well, well, slow down. Just because you sin on this doesn't mean that you're a mortal sin. There are mitigating factors. At that time, that was uncontroversial. So the conservative faction could just pick this up and clarified the church teaching as they have been doing throughout 
tw 10 or 20 years of internet before, but they didn't. They just kept saying, oh, this is confusing. Oh, this is ambiguous. I don't accept the Pope clarifying this way. If the Pope, if this is what Amor Zotitia, this is sinful, this is, this is heterodox, this is heretical. And now, now, after, after so many years, we finally see liberal theologians picking up on Amor Zotitia and trying to distort it. But it took this amount of years. I think that this would not have happened if the conservatives would have picked up on what they had and have, had simply done what they had done in the previous two pontificates. We would not be in this situation, in my opinion. Do you think that they responded in the way that they did because they saw that there were a lot of people who were distorting Amor Satizia and also distorting the teaching of the church in order to promote divorce and remarriage? And so what they were doing is they were reacting against that and they kind of overreacted against the document because, again, there were people who were using the document to promote that heterodox position. Do you acknowledge that there were people who were using the document for those purposes? There might have been, but let me tell you something. When I was researching for the book, it was very hard for me to find in 2016 or 2017 people who live on a liberal, on a liberal faction trying to distort Amor Zotizia. This is something that is starting to happen now, 2021, 2020. What I, don't, I know that there might have been some people, okay, mm -hmm. but... It's not well, it's not as conspicuous as let, let me clarify because yeah, okay, I understand the point you're making. Let me rephrase. There were people who were trying to distort the teachings of the church on divorce and remarriage and undermine mm -hmm. it at that time. Do you think that that's maybe why some of the people on the more conservative end overreacted against the document because they felt that the document is lending itself to the people who were attempting to distort the church's teaching? Theoretically, but in practice, I think no. As I said, uh, I think this overreaction has to has something else. Uh, since Pope Francis was elected, and uh, I actually went went with the flow for some time. Uh, I, I was scared because everyone who, until then, I respected as an opinion maker was saying, oh, Pope Francis is a dangerous liberal. Pope Francis is this, Pope Francis is that. And I remember going re to read, for example, Laudato Si and being afraid. Oh, is the Pope going to finally teach something heterodox? Mm -hmm. Since... Pope Francis was elected since he appeared in St. Peter's balcony with that in pure white, since he chose the name Francis, there has been a, a, a hermeneutic of suspicion regarding Pope Francis. And I don't think the I don't think people who have been faithful in the previous two pontificates, I don't think that they gave him Ch uh, the chances that they say they, they did. Uh, so I think Amores Letizia was finally the outlet in which they could finally say, ah, I knew that he was heterodox. I knew it. He's teaching something that contradicts John Paul II, that teaches in that country, it's Benedict XVI. It was an overreaction to a perceived image of this pontificate that does not correspond to reality, in my opinion. Uh, and I do, I do, I'm not saying that there were not liberals distorting the teaching, but I think that the overreaction is actually to what these faithful Catholics were perceiving was the agenda of this pontificate. I think that's fair because at the time when Amor Satizia came out, that was my impression as well. And I've, I've, reformulated my position on it looking further into it and having had more time to reflect on it but yeah at that time i i was among those who kind of had that impression that that underlying suspicion that was already there this just confirmed it you know that pope uh pope francis was heterodox so i think that that's a that's a fair observation that you're offering here um why do you think then that you know if the church's teaching hasn't changed and really if the discipline hasn't really significantly changed here. 
what then was the purpose of the synod on the family if you know things effectively have already just you know it's it's just the status quo I think the discipline did change. The discipline before, during John Paul II and Benedict XVI did not include mitigating factors. It was just living as brother and sister, period. Mm -hmm. So the discipline did change. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we are still in the beginning phase of the implementation of this, of this document. Uh, I mentioned in my book, for example, in Braga, which is a, a big diocese in Portugal, they have really taken the, the Amores Letizia to the next level. They have created uh, an office for accompaniment of divorce and remarried, which includes not just pastors. Of course, the pastors are important, but uh, and it includes a path uh, of discernment that includes uh, retreats, reflections you you just go to the sacraments at the fin at the final stage of a path you don't you don't uh, take communion when you're in the beginning of this path you have to go through lots of retreats lots of uh, reflections prayers uh, it's like a course in a sense but this office does not include just the pastoral part it also includes psychologists, um, social services, uh, everything that may help these these people who are in these situations. Uh, and I think that is the way to go. It, it really, there is a problem here in the church. Their uh, divorce has become widespread and obviously remarriage has become widespread. And these people need to come back to the church and some are already inside the church but their place here is still undefined we need to clarify this we need to we need to help and we need to uh, we need to put uh, give more than just you know just hammer doctrine into them the doctrine is important but it's not sufficient if we really want to solve this problem we want the dog to permeate into their hearts, but sometimes it's not just a matter of preaching. It's, we might need something else. But I would also like to just point out something that usually uh, falls is forgotten during the, the, the discussions with Amoris Letizia, is that we're talking about a single chapter of Amoris Letizia. Amoris Letizia is a very big document and a very beautiful one at that. And uh, Pope Francis has expressed at least twice that I document in my book um, a certain disappointment that people are just focusing on the divorce and remarriage part. This is not what he intended. He, he just he wanted this Amor's Letizia to be much more. He wanted the the church, the the way the church would reform herself regarding the family love to be much more than and it's something that i think it's a constant frustration for him he tries to create this more synodal church but in the end there is there, there's these two political blocks in a culture war that uh, hijack the the synods and manipulate the synods to try to, to to defend their ideological position and not let the holy spirit just talk freely the holy spirit to say conserve this uh, let's reform that and the, this is not this is not happening uh, everything is turned into a culture war at this moment in the church and even in the world uh, whether it is how to deal with a pandemic or how to deal with a war, everything is ideologized. There's two blocks, one on one side, one on the other. One says yes, the other has to say no because the others have to be wrong all the time. And concrete solutions, creative solutions to the problems that do not fall into these two ideological camps, they don't exist. Let me return to the question of the church's discipline, because I don't believe it has substantially changed. I know you said that you think it has. I don't believe it has. And the reason why is we both agree the document itself still indicates one is supposed to go to confession. So confession is not divorced from the Eucharist. So I don't think the discipline has changed. You're, you're appealing to the fact that mitigating circumstances is highlighted. 
that's true, but that hasn't changed the discipline, not substantially. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I believe so. You're, you're correct in that assessment, of course, John Paul. This, if if a couple was living as brother and sister and eventually they would fall into sin, they would go to reconciliation, etc. But mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of different because here we are talking about a person who for some reason uh, from due to these mitigating factors is impeded in the mm -hmm. in a regular way of fulfilling mm -hmm. that uh, living as brother and sister in the sense yeah and there there is even a cdf document at the time of john paul ii that explicitly uh, excluded the mitigating factors uh, mm -hmm. not not the cdf document uh, pardon me um a, a declaration from the Pontifical Council of Legislative Texts that was trying to interpret canon law accordingly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there is there is a, a, a certain change, but mm -hmm. uh, disciplines can and do change. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the West, we have a complete celibate priests in the Eastern Calyx. We have uh, priests that are ordained while, while they're married. So uh, just because there is a change in discipline doesn't mean that there, this is possible and has happened in the church many times before. So sure. it's yeah. uh, it, as long as the doctrine remains intact, which I believe it has, there's no problem. Yeah, as long as the discipline is not a complete contradiction to the doctrine. And yeah, I, I do also agree that disciplines could change again with that caveat that I just mentioned. However, I don't see mm -hmm. any evidence that it has changed. So I, I do contest mm -hmm. it, even though we might still say, you know, discipline could could be adjusted. But what would you say to those who say, okay, well, I understand what you're saying about mitigating circumstances, but we still have the problem that uh, commune, you, you have this public scandal. You know, if somebody knows mm -hmm. this person is divorced and remarriage, you have this scandal because they think, oh, well, I guess it's okay to be divorced and remarriage. I guess I can do that too and still go and receive communion. So what would you say to somebody who says, but look, this isn't a good idea because it causes scandal. Even if the person individually has mitigating circumstances, you still have an occasion of scandal. Well, that I also dedicate a whole chapter of my book to the scandal. Uh, yeah, uh, in fact, the um, scandal is one of the reasons that John Paul II explicitly says that we sh that divorce and remarriage should not receive communion. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. He says that certain divorce and remarried people can receive communion if they live as brother and sister. Well, how mm -hmm. do you know? if though if they are living as brother and sister all you know sure. is that they are divorced so what what how did you do that it's through the internal forum mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, it, uh the priest is not meant to give communion in a public way in, in mm -hmm. fact the priest what uh, by creating this internal forum we are creating the conditions of privacy that will allow the priest better guide Mm -hmm. the people in these situations so the uh, he, both in amoris Letizia and in the buenos aires guidelines it says specifically that we should avoid scandal and mm -hmm. the way to avoid scandal is doing this in the internal forum mm -hmm. though i also argue and i don't know if the i don't know if this is something that happens in the us but here in mm -hmm. europe it happens a lot uh People just don't don't really know what the Eucharist is, and you know, uh, uh, and many times they don't even un they don't even know well these distinctions between mortal sin, venial sin, divorce, remarry, blah blah. They don't know this, so are they really becoming so scandalized? I think that they are be pro being protected by their ignorance, and I I say in my book this is a perfect chance to catechize these, these people who are living ignorance and catechize them not only on the value of the Eucharist, how we are receiving the true body and blood of the Lord, but also how the Eucharist, and this is Pope Francis, is not to be viewed as um, a prize for the perfect, but a medicine for the weak. So we should not be scandalized that a sinner is receiving communion. We don't know if this, we don't know what this person is going through we don't know if this person has um 
has uh, has, part, has gone to the sacrament of reconciliation it, we shouldn't judge this person uh, let's the, we should be concerned with ourselves and whether we are being worthy while receiving the sacraments uh, we sh i think that we have to stop being scandalized about the the other people receiving the sacraments um we don't know we don't know the state of the soul of that person um, offer a clarification for me. I think some of our viewers may have misunderstood you. Uh, Crimson says, I don't understand why Dr. Gabriel says that living as brother and sister is a matter of discipline. That's an obligation of natural law. It can't be changed. The question is why Morris Letizia doesn't mention that moral obligation to live in continence at all. I did not interpret you in the way that I guess he did. Can you offer some clarification here? I, I don't say that living as brother and sister is a matter of discipline. Yeah, okay. I didn't think that you were saying living, that living as brother and sister is part of not having intercourse with someone who are not legitimately married. So it's a matter of doctrine. It's a matter that can't be changed. I completely and fully agree. Uh, what is a matter of discipline is whether a person who is living uh, in this in this irregular situation can receive communion or not based on whether this person is a mortal sin or not. Mm -hmm. So there is here a distinction that we have to we have to bring forward. One thing is the objective situation of the uh, the objective gravity of the sin. It is it is it is a grave matter. It is sinful. Period. So the other thing is the subjective culpability. But the subjective culpability does not change the matter of the sin. Okay, so for instance, this is something that I, this is another uh, you know, completely different sin, but I also express this in the book. Now, imagine a woman who is pregnant and she had a one, a one night stand and she th thinks, oh, this baby is not very convenient for me at this time. Uh, I wanted, I'm not ready for commitment. I'm just going to abort. Hmm? Now, and there's another that is a, a teenage girl who is raped by her stepfather and the stepfather forces her to abort in order to not dishonor him, okay? And she's forced into it. Now, uh, if you see this, this is, in both situations, a baby is killed. And the fact that one baby is the son of that uh, of that terrible, terrible uh, situation does not change the fact that that baby is a human being and he deserves to live. Whereas the other baby that was also killed, this it, it was also it was also an objectively evil act. But you cannot say that. The culpability is the same in 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 the in both situations. It's not in one in one situation the girl is not even culpable at all. So that's the point. The objective the objective uh, situation does not change, but the subjective culpability does. And if this person does not have subjective culpability, then this person is not in mortal sin and may receive communion. This does not change at all the, 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 the demand to live as brother and sister. Now, why didn't Pope Francis um, mention this, uh, this during, in Amor's Letizia? I think that uh, there, is, um, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a pivotal part of the document that is usually overlooked, which is at the beginning of everything that is said about mitigating circumstances it says for this discernment that will lead to the sacraments for this discernment to start these conditions necessarily be present necessarily humility uh, for, and love for the church and her teaching so what we are dealing here is with people who already love the church the people who already love the the church teaching and they want to receive it. So why are you going to rehash to these persons that they have to live as brother or sister? They already know. They already know this and they feel, fall short. 
So there's no reason to hammer this again on them. And just to finalize the, my comment to this, to 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 what the to the viewer said, there is another um, another guideline, another bishop, uh, uh, another guideline from that is usually not taught, which are the Lisbon guidelines. I know about them because I'm Portuguese, uh, but the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon uh, issued some guidelines in which he structures the approach. And he structures it precisely like this. First, you have to ascertain the situation, blah, blah, blah. Afterwards, you have to propose to these couples to live as brother and sister. And afterwards, when this is not possible, that's when you, the mitigating factors kick in. So he structures the approach in this systematic fashion. And Pope Francis sent a letter to the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon saying this it, this it reflects perfectly what I was, what what I ended. It's not just the Buenos Aires guidelines, even though the Buenos Aires guidelines are the only ones that Pope Francis published in the Acta Apostolica says they are the ones that are uh, that were turned magisterial. But Pope Francis also gave public and unequivocal recognition to these guidelines that mention the living as brother and sister uh, approach. And when I read Amor Satitia, it calls them to um, the ideal over and over and over. So obviously mm -hmm. the question of living as brother and sister, which is not even the ideal, is included whenever the church calls them to the ideal. If they call them to the ideal, they're calling them to everything beneath the ideal, such as the brother and sister issue. So I do think that it's kind of a red herring to say, well, he doesn't repeat it. Well, he doesn't have to since he's already calling them to a greater standard than that, and that is the ideal. Um, and and uh, now let me just say one thing regarding that, that uh, Pro Professor Robert Fastigi, a renowned theologian, uh, argues that he believes that ideal that word has been wrongly translated because in in Latin is exemplar, uh, so it's something different. Ideal gives the idea that this is something that is not achievable. But Pope Francis right. says that we can <laughs> achieve. Pope Francis says this specifically in Amoris Laetitia. This can be achieved yeah. every every yeah. time with right. the help of grace. With Good the help point. of grace. Good point. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, the. The word ideal is not quite mm -hmm. what he had in mind. It's, it's more like uh, the what it's more like an example of what a person tries to achieve. The goal, the goal. Yeah. I think it's more a uh, more perf a better translation. That's a good point because some people are going to say that the ideal is unachievable, but Amor Satitia itself notes that God is not calling you to anything that you can't achieve, and that's based on the Council of Trent. God is going to offer yes. the grace necessary, and he makes that clear in Amor Satitia. So I think that that's a good point that you're bringing up here. Uh, this is from Mahoville. He's offering a comment regarding public scandal, especially in cities. People don't know each other at all in most cases, or they know each other really well enough to know nuances. Yeah, I, I think that that's fair point. Sure. Yeah. Um, Reality is complex. Of course, it's not going to be the same everywhere. And yeah. in some places, yes, it's going to, it, it, obviously, it's going to, in some places, what I said might not be applicable, of course. I'm just talking about my own experience. I don't know if you want to comment on this one, um, but... Thunder Thumbs asks, there are some theologians that propose a more satitia creates grounds to further proportionalist moral theory and undoing veritatis splendor. Is, are there any grounds for this statement? Care to take a stab at that? Yes. Uh, actually, it, I dedicate a whole chapter to veritatis splendor, mm -hmm. and it's uh, very interesting, uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. But regarding proportionalist moral, proportionalist moral theology, uh, and not just proportionalism, subjectivism, relativism, fundamental option theory, um, um, con consequentialism, and uh, situationalism, situation ethics. All of these are condemned in, in Veritatis Splendor, but all of them have nuance. 
which is they say that intrinsically evil acts are justified in certain situations. Amor Zatizia does not say that those intrinsically evil acts are being justified. It just says that a person might not have a total culpability, which presupposes that we are all talking about an intrinsically evil act. You cannot be culpable. You cannot be guilty of something that is not evil. So you cannot have reduced culpability of something that is not evil, period. You're not culpable. So that's the nuance that, that those proportionalist, uh, proportionalist uh, and other erroneous moral theologies, they, that's, how we, that's how we prevent them from gaining traction. And they are gaining traction right now. So we need to stop them on their tracks at this moment. But there's also another thing that is important to note, which is when we talk about Veritatis Splendor, usually people just focus on this, on, on talking about proportionalism, intrinsically evil acts. But Veritatis Splendor is much broader than this. And it actually has two, two parts. In the second part, it condemns these erroneous errors, these erroneous moral theologies. But in the first part, it talks about something else. Why, why does it go to the second part? Because in the first part, Veritatis Splendor is calling for a renewal of moral theology. It specifically says so. And it, it tries to, it, it, it uses the, the, the story of Jesus and the rich man. He invites the rich man to follow him, but the rich man goes away. And it, John Paul II is clear that he wants to go away from a legalistic view of the law. It has to be something that comes from the inside. From, and we have to rely more on grace. So John Paul II is asking for a renewal of moral theology. And then, precisely because he is asking for this renewal, he says, watch out, this renewal must not fall, must not fall into these errors. It cannot fall into proportionalism, it cannot be this, it cannot be that. It must take into account that there are intrinsic evil acts. So this second part must be read in light of the first part of the encyclical. And I believe that Amor Zotizi is trying to do this. It's trying to respond to this call for a renewal of moral theology, go beyond the manualistic and casuistic view of moral theology, and try to incorporate the complexity of reality without without issuing intrinsically evil, that there are intrinsically evil acts, but there's more to it. And it has to do with subjective culpability. I think this is the this is the um, this is the way the way to respond to John Paul II. In fact, John Paul II, throughout his pontificate, developed the the, the teaching on mitigating circumstances in a ways that were not, not that were not present before his pontificate. It was him who wrote the Catechism. Uh, about uh, about subject mitigating factors in Evangelium Vitae, he says that uh, sins against life sometimes they may arise from situations in which the person is not sub subjectively culpable. In very splendor itself, reconciliatio penitentia, he develops the doctrine of mitigating circumstances. And Pope Francis just picks that up and applies it to. At, to the situation of divorce and remarried people, a situation where they they did, where they were not the, the, these factors were not taken into consideration before, so that's how this is this is the nuance. We are not doing away with veritatis splendor. We are fulfilling it. Maybe I'll offer clarification here. He says Crimson says Dr. Gabriel seems to be wrong on this. Diminished culpability is possible, but it can't change the species of the act. In the abortion example you gave, it's still murder. Are you saying that the species of the act changes? I think that the point that I made was precisely that that it doesn't change the species of the act. And in both situations, right. a, ch a child was killed. I think uh, that mm -hmm. was the point that I was trying to make. 
Right. The, the species of the act does not change. The subjective culpability does. A child yeah. is killed, but both are not equally culpable. That's that's precisely my point. I agree with you. That's how I read you. I just wanted you to clarify that. That's very helpful. Yeah, I think we grabbed all of the questions there. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. This was very helpful. And, uh, you know, I, I want to point everybody again to the book. I'm going to put a link there in the description. Go and purchase a copy. But also put in a plug for anything else that you're working on and you want to make the viewers aware of. Well, uh, yes, of course. Uh, I uh, Very recently, I also set up... Um, uh, a website, The City and the World, which is mostly for my journalistic piece. And in this in this um, website, I'm also doing some Amores Letizia talks with uh, voices, Catholic commentators, theologians, thinkers that whose voice has not been heard during throughout this, all this controversy. And I think they need to be heard. So the first uh, talk has been with uh, Professor Fastigi who has been very helpful and he's been very kind to me but there are more talks coming coming forward and of course there's also uh, the articles that i've been that are publishing where peter is and uh, for now that's that's it and the book the orthodoxy of amoris letizia because it really i think it summarizes um and uh answers many, many uh, arguments that were not even discussed here. Uh, I try to be as complete and systematic as possible. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think I saw a little bit of the video conversation, um, I, I believe, that you had with Dr. Fastigi. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's great. And I look forward to seeing and hearing more from you. So um, any other books that you're working on, by the way? Uh, Yes, uh, but uh, for now, I'm just going yeah. to keep them <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> secret. No <problem. laughs> but I can already say that I am 10 pages away from finishing another book. Yes. Oh, excellent. Look forward to it. Well, let me know whenever you finish <laughs> But it. I, will leave, I will leave that as a surprise. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. When it comes out. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be in touch about that. Once again, thanks for coming on, everybody. Thank you all for watching and for your participation there in the chat. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. Don't Also, don't forget to check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you appreciated this and you want to support me. All right. See you later. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now. Oh wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.